תודה רבה לדיוויד. אני מתכוון להזמין אורח שלנו שהגיע הבוקר בטיסה אחרי שהטיסה שלו אתמול התעכבה, את מרק ג'יימסון מ-CSFI, שידבר על לוחמת רשת, סייבר אופריישנס, והקשר של זה לנושא ההגנה הפיננסית בסייבר. מרק. without no sleep, but I hope to, uh, we'll manage. <laughs> Good afternoon. Do I click? Yes, I can do. On that one. This one here? Yes. Okay. Okay, so a little bit about myself. A little bit about myself first. Uh, I was in the Air Force for 24 years. I flew the B-1 bomber as a weapon systems officer, so I'm also an electronic warfare officer. And uh, my last assignment was at, uh, at Fort Meade. I helped stand up U.S. Cyber Command and um, spent three years there. I retired about two years ago, worked for L3 Communications, and now I have my own company and I'm on the board of directors for a cybersecurity forum initiative that, we're, that is here today and working with Gabby for future events. So this discussion, or these slides, are from a uh, Electronic Warfare Summit briefing I gave back in April, and there's at least an hour's worth of information here. So I'll pick out a few nuggets. I cut it down. Um, I'll pick out a few nuggets that I think are relevant to uh, cybersecurity and innovation and the speed of it and how we deal with it, and hopefully uh, provide some insights from uh, my background. So here's the agenda or the roadmap today. You know, moving beyond, the previous speaker talked about trust. It's exactly where we are with a lot of this. Um, General Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he was at Brookings Institute two weeks ago and he talked about a whole of government approach. I'll talk today about a whole of nation approach. Um, I have a slide on that, but we have to get everybody involved, academic, academia, industry, and so forth. And then I talk about a, a developing an experimentation roadmap, 12 for a 12-month experimentation roadmap. I was involved in what we call JE effects, is Joint Expeditionary Force Experiments in the U.S., the Air Force, four different ones. And what we did was we, uh, we took some problem sets from the different challenges we had, and within a 12-month cycle, it was really more of an 18-month cycle, we spiraled the challenges and we came up with solutions that made sense and then fielded those. And then lastly, we'll talk about future talent. Okay, innovation, it's not just about, you know, products. It's really about ideas. And uh, if we know a little bit about Moore's Law, you know, he started off with the discussion that you would duplicate computing power every 24 months. He later revised that to every 18 months. But everybody probably has a smartphone. If you look down at the bottom bullet here, you know, how many iPhones have come out? About every 18 months or so. Um, so if you look at that, and if you look at the Androids, and if you look at the technology that's flooding, you know, our kids in our, in our, in our pockets, frankly, um, you can see the innovation is speeding away. So I have a little discussion about IEDs up there. Uh, the last audience was an electronic warfare audience, and I was either directly or indirectly involved with IEDs, um, defeating IEDs for, I don't know, seven, eight years, and the different jobs that I had. And one of the things that I noticed was it was not really the technology. It was the tactics, techniques, and procedures that were changing. That was the delta. They were using different technologies, but once we understood what those were, then they were moving on. And it's a game. This is the same game that's played in cyber. You know, new technology helps folks figure out how to get into your systems, but a lot of times they reuse the same thing over and over again. Once you adjust, they adjust. In electronic warfare, we call it countermeasures or counter-countermeasures. So it's a... Uh, it's a um, 
it's a battle back and forth on um, determining, you know, what countermeasures and measure you use to defend yourself and, frankly, uh, attack the enemy. So how do we how do we deal with the speed of this innovation? So uh, after I retired, I moved back to Texas. I live in San Antonio now. And my, uh, my brother has a farm, and there's lots of deer and alligators and so forth. And I like to hunt. And, but you got to get there. I live in San Antonio, and you got to go, I don't know, almost 300 miles northeast. And there's no way to get there directly. So you have to go in these back roads. And usually there's some police. You know, that's how they make their money in Texas. You, you're allowed to have a radar detector, but they set up police traps. And sure enough, the first time I went to go visit my brother's farm, I got a ticket. And because it went from 75 miles an hour to 50 miles an hour in a, in a blink, and I was probably talking on the phone or something. I don't know. I didn't see it. And so I started going back and looking at what kind of radar detectors are out there. And being an electronic warfare officer, a WISA, a weapon systems officer on B1, I'm used to having situational awareness. And so there's a company called, uh, that makes a, a, a radar detector that I had in college called Escort. And now it has an application on your iPhone that when, if you're connected to the internet and if you have um, your radar detector on and my radar detector goes off, it informs the network, all of you out there that have the same software and the same radar detector where that radar, where that radar detector is. And so it's shared awareness. It also plots a history of where those are. So if I would have done my mission planning like I'm used to, would have planned ahead, I would have known that, you know, this town, this town, this town, historically have, you know, police trying to make their dollar, um, you know, during their speed traps. That shared awareness is exactly where we need to get in cyber. And so we'll talk about the whole of nation approach, but that was my experience, and we've got to figure out how we can share awareness on what's going on. Talk about AMN, that's Afghan Mission Network. One of my teams when I was at Cyber Command was tasked uh, by General McChrystal to figure out how we work together to provide classified information to all the you know, 42 coalition folks that were in there in Afghanistan. The reality was it was a cobbled together network. You couldn't get there from here. And so the team was looking at all the different ways that we could make it work. The problem is you didn't have enough money to make it work. You didn't have enough time to make it work. And as everybody knows, anytime you invite somebody else into your network, you're opening yourself up. NATO has standards. The US had different standards. Different nations have different standards. And so trying to get everybody on the same sheet of mu music was difficult. And so you'll hear a discussion about trying to move from a heterogeneous network to a homogeneous network. It's very, very difficult. Um, another discussion that kind of parallels that is a discussion about bring your own advice, bring BYOD. Well, I would argue, at least in my experience, we've been bringing our own devices to the network for years, you know, based on technical refresh and at least. Uh, you know, in the Air Force, the way it worked was each base would get their own pot of money and they would refresh and buy the equipment of choice by the, uh, by the uh, organization that was buying it. And there wasn't a concerted effort to do the same things. And so we've been bringing our own devices to the network for years. You know, different computers, different switches. And so trying to move from a heterogeneous network to a homogeneous network, I think that's admirable goal, but I'm not sure you can get there from here. And then uh, unity of effort. Um, well, I'll talk about that in, in when we talk about the uh, whole of nation approach. Okay, so this slide gets into kind of uh, where, where do we need to go and what the U.S. has done. The DIB is a, is a cyber DIB, defense industrial base. There's 20 or 30 companies that have signed up for this and it's supposed to support shared awareness. Um, it's moving in the right direction, but it's not enough. And then recently there's an executive order by the president, but it's not law, so it doesn't have any teeth. And it talks about critical infrastructure, but it does bring awareness to what's going on. 
Um, but, but it's moving in the right direction, but not enough. And then we talk about down here to a push system. This gets back to my shared awareness with the radar detector. Um, if everybody knows, you know, it's basically crowdsourcing, understanding what's going on, on uh, not only your network, but others. So let's get into the whole of nation approach. Okay, so General Dempsey talked at Brookings Institute uh, two weeks ago about this whole of government approach, but I think that misses the whole point. When more than 95% of the networks, at least in the U.S., that the DOD uses are private, you know, or public networks, I should say, through companies, um, it has to be a whole of nation approach. So that includes industry. When you say whole of government approach, you've, you've already decided that the risk is not going to be shared and that, sh and that shared awareness or awareness um, beyond the government is optional. Uh, I think we need to move past that paradigm. So one of my jobs uh, at Fort Meade was for two years run the Joint Interagency Task Force for Cyber. And we had 27 agencies and uh, organizations, uh, Department of Defense and so forth, State Department, Treasury Department, FBI and so forth. And while we had, we tried to provide shared awareness, one of the challenges was the different authorities and the different uh, lanes in the road. Um, we're working through that. That's, we're making progress in that arena. But it gets to this whole of nation approach. What was missing besides all the agencies was some of the larger corporations, the defense contractors, and academia. At one of my discussions, somebody came up to me and said, so, you know, universities could provide sensors out there on the boundary or different boundaries and provide a, uh, a common... Um, a common shared awareness point. That's exactly right. So getting um, the universities involved, most of them have comp sci, uh, organizations, uh, degrees and so forth. They're already doing things on their own, but connecting them so you have a shared awareness. Bringing in the whole of nation approach. One of the things we did at the Shriver 10 War Game, which is an annual event uh, with space and cyber, is that there was an industry cell. And so what would happen is when a challenge came up, either in the space arena or in the cyberspace arena, that we actually didn't have solution for, either tools or, or procedures or you know a concept of how we ought to do this. We had an industry, uh, a industry cell in the other room, in an unclassified room, and we'd throw them the problem and the challenge and say, okay, Here's something we have going on. We'd strip out the classified information, and inevitably, they would come up with two or three different ways to potentially solve the problem that we couldn't, you know, we didn't have experience in. These were experts in their field. And then they would throw it across, across the, uh, the wall, and, you know, it, maybe it was actionable, maybe it wasn't. But the reality was getting them involved was key. This is alive and well in the space industry. It needs to be alive and well in the cyber industry. And then down at the bottom, I think it's important to get the nonprofits involved. Um, you know, your organization here, INSS, and others, CSFI, uh, AFCIA, which is Armed Forces Communication Electronics Association in the U.S., and other organizations that have um, that have interest in the same and experts in the same arena to kind of bring their minds together and have conferences and discuss and highlight uh, what's important. Thank you. So Would you like me to start over? What? Would you like me to start over? No, no, no. I said <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, so I have this slide up here about exercises versus experimentation. And, you know, there's actually another, you know, there's training also. You have training, you have exercises, and you have experimentation. And so, you know, there are exercises out there. And actually, let me back up a little bit. 
um, early on, the predecessor U.S. Cyber Command, so Joint Forces or Joint Functional Component Command for Network Warfare, where I was the Director of Operations, to bring leadership up to speed, we had lots of tabletop exercises. We would spend an hour, two hours, three hours. We'd provide a scenario and just quickly peel the onion back to understand because we had to start socializing the challenges that cyberspace presented. The reality is um, we spent a lot of time educating leadership. At the same time, we had to educate and, and build ourselves up. Uh, somebody asked me once, he said, so what is a cyber warrior? Well, they don't really exist because in my experience, the people that we had involved in cyber that currently have in cyber come from three or four different backgrounds. They're either communication or signals officers. They're either intel officers. Um, they're either space officers in, in the Air Force. Or they're combat arms officers like me. They either, you know, drove a tank, flew a jet, fired a, fired a rifle, a soldier, or a Marine. And so, you had to take those three groups of people, three or four groups of people, and build a cyber warrior. And so exercises and tabletop exercises were important to start socializing the challenges and then therefore the requirements um, to uh, start working the cyber challenge. So one of the things, uh, and I'm skipping around a little bit because this briefing was for about an hour long and, and Gabby only gave me 20 minutes. So, um, One of the things that uh, we started in October 2011 was Cyber Flag 2012. So for those that understand what Red Flag is, Red Flag is a, is a flying exercise out in Nevada where planes uh, duplicate or um, simulate the enemy. And so the idea is that Red Flag is the first 10 missions, combat missions, out in the desert. So during my career, the aggressors or the adversary would simulate, just name one of the different uh, adversaries the U.S. may have, they would simulate those. They would not only fly the tactics, techniques, and procedures of the enemy, but they would try to uh, emulate uh, the, uh, the aircraft or the missile systems on the ground. And so um, what we needed in cyber was something like that to um, focus the crews that are from the different services on what you know an adversary may or may not do. And so this first cyber flag, we had two goals. The first goal was to get the offensive and defensive guys working together. They were in different units. They were in different parts of the world, different parts of uh, the Air Force, Army, Navy, and Marines. The second goal was to get Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines working together because they're all focused on their own cyber to support cyber, cyber to support the, uh, the armed forces. And so those two goals um, were the beginning of Cyber Flag. Cyber Flag is scheduled for 2014 at the Nellis Range in October, beginning of November. In my understanding, the first one was about 150 people. This one will be over 1,000 people. So we've ramped up significantly trying to give realistic training, and um, that's exercising. But there's not only value for the crews, but there's value for leadership, because when the leadership sees what the crews are capable of doing, or frankly, the tools they don't have, then, uh, then they get involved. So at the discussion of the uh, Electronic Warfare Summit briefing that I gave, one of the discussions was how do we get there from here, innovation. And so what I saw in the Joint Experimentation, or Joint Ex uh, Expedition Force Experiment in the Air Force, uh, the three or four times that I did it was that they had a scenario, then they had 18 months to solve some of the top 10 challenges. And so that's what I recommend, uh, I have recommended to the U.S to come up with an experimentation cycle for cyber. So you take on the top 10 challenges, you bring people to the table, you work those challenges, and then you have a leave behind. And you move from theory and admiring the problem to actually producing something. The government gets involved, industry gets involved, 
and there's some type of leave behind and follow through to, for the warrior. Here's some details on it. Uh, one of my frustrations was I did an experiment with the uh, US Stratcom last year at this time and uh, there was no leave behind. My company, the company I was working for at the time, had spent a million dollars of its own money to, to uh, play in the game with, you know, with the idea that there would be some follow on, follow through, but there wasn't. That's not what I saw uh, in the Air Force a couple years ago. If a company invested, then there would be some type of follow through if, um, if it worked. Okay, and lastly, cyber talent. Um, I'm from San Antonio, Texas, and that was actually the birthplace of Cyber Patriot, which is a high school uh, war game, high school cyber game for uh, kids uh, 14 to 18 years old. And uh, that grew from a handful of teams to over 500 teams in the U.S. in high schools that were doing capture the flag events where they would be given a challenge either to defend, um, usually to defend, but the idea was they defend and attack. And so colleges and um, academic organizations and uh, DOD has supported it's the Air Force Association that is behind Cyber Patriot. And the whole idea is we've got to build our own. Cyber warriors don't exist. One of my challenges when we uh, sent teams, cyber support elements to Afghanistan and Iraq was finding guys that could not only understand the zeros and ones, but understood military planning and understood um, how to integrate potential cyber effects into the battle. And what we found is these guys don't exist. And so the Cyber Patriot program is starting at the high school level. I was just at, uh, I'm on the um, Chamber of Commerce IT Committee in San Antonio, and we just had a meeting two weeks ago, and the discussion centered around how do we attract and, and uh, maintain the talent in San Antonio. Um, there's lots of jobs. If any Java developers in here that want a job in San Antonio, let me know, because I've got uh, two or three companies that need people. Um, but, uh, you know, attracting and keeping talent is difficult. And so what they've determined is they've got to start training their own. And um, so even uh, institutions like the Chambers of Commerce are trying to get on board with coming up with a road map on how to start at the high school level and the college level, you know, summer internships and so forth. How do we get the talent in the door and how do we keep them? whether they want to, you know, uh, go on to the military or not. Okay, here's some takeaways. One of the things I wanted to point out, though, um, Paul uh, D'Souza, who's talked earlier today from Cybersecurity Forum Initiative, we have developed some training, some hands-on training, initial training for cyber warfare and some hands-on training. And then uh, I just have recently developed, in fact, uh, we, ha we think we have our first class with the New, New Jersey uh, Tennessee Air National Guard here in about a month, a strategy and planning course. And when I gave a speech at, in Arlington, Texas last week, uh, one of the questions was asked is, you know, where, do we, where, where are we missing talent? Well, there's plenty of technical training out there, but I think where we are missing um, capability is people that think through challenges, take a strategic viewpoint of cybersecurity and plan. Um, one of the scenarios that we'll do this afternoon, you'll see that the adversary took a lot, uh, during the tabletop, took a year to plan out their game and what they were going to do for the tabletop, for the, uh, for the uh, attack that they, they commit. And uh, that's huge. And so a lot of times, at least what I saw in cyber warfare, is that people are very reactionary. You can't be that way. You have to be strategic. You have to plan. And you have to think about things. That's all my prepared comments. I kind of jumped around because my slides were for a little bit longer. But uh, if I have a minute or two, I'll be glad to take some questions, if that's all right, Gabby. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. You see, you see collaboration, for example, between the U.S. and uh, Europe, Israel, 
terms of like tactical information sharing about joint adversaries, stuff like that? Is it like realistic? It has to be realistic. The threat's not going away. In fact, it's getting larger. We've got to figure out how we can come together and share awareness and protect each other's, you know, intellectual property at the same time. So, you know, it's sticky. It's a, you know, there's that whole wicked problem out there. You poke at one side and it, something else comes out the other side. But you, I think we have to tackle it. And we are making inroads and in working with some of our allies and sharing awareness. So, yes, I think it's realistic.